Hi, everybody. I see the number of participants continuing to tick up, so I'm going to give folks another minute or so uh, to get logged in before we get started this afternoon. I think we've we've started to level off, so I'll go ahead and get, and get started and folks might continue to join us over the next few minutes. Good afternoon and thank you so much for being here. My name is Meredith Drosbeck and I'm the Associate Director for Science at Sciline. I'll tell you more about the organization a little later in this talk, but the short version is this. We help journalists reporting on science get the information and the expertise they need for their story. In my role, I oversee the team that handles the recruitment, outreach, and engagement with scientific experts from around the country who work with us on all of the services we provide. I am truly delighted to have been invited to run this workshop today by both Boston University's Marketing Communications Department and the Research Office. And I welcome all of the BU researchers from across the Charles River and medical campuses to join us today. This workshop is part of Boston University's strategic communication series, which is about helping faculty learn the skills to communicate their research and expertise in effective, compelling, and accessible ways. One technical note, if you have a question today, please feel free to put that in the Q&A box. And I'm gonna to pause to address some of those questions periodically as we go through the presentation. And then we'll also hopefully have some time uh, for additional questions at the end. So without further ado, let's begin. I'm gonna share my slides, I think. Okay. All of you proactively signed up for this workshop. You are, are willing to devote part of your afternoon to it. Um, and so I am grateful for that. But before we dive into talking about media interviews and all of the associated details, I actually want to step back and ask you all to think about a bigger question first. I want you to think about why you want to communicate at all. What is the goal that you're trying to achieve? I suspect that a lot of you have a lot of different reasons that you're trying to communicate, you're interested in communicating. Some of you may want to influence policy. Some of you might want to influence behavior of um, your, your local community members or people around the country. Some of you are, are probably interested in, in getting good, solid, reliable information out there and in counteracting misinformation. And others of you may be interested in weighing in um, and impacting the issues that you care about in your community. Whatever those reasons are, we're gonna spend the next hour talking about reporters and interviews, the things that I think you should need, you should be thinking about as you prepare. But amidst all of that detail, I don't want you to lose sight of your high level goals because there's a reason you're doing this um, and it's easy to get down into the weeds and get lost and forget that, that there really is a goal you're trying to achieve in this. So remember to remind yourself about that every, every so often. To kick things off, the first thing we knew, need to do is define what we mean by communication. So here's a definition. Communication is the process of conveying information and ideas from one person to others through a common system of words, symbols, or behavior. Communicating can, communicating can mean from one person to another or from one person to a larger group. And that audience, whether it's one person or many, matters. It matters a lot. Everything that you say and do is going to be filtered by that audience's own biases, by their attitudes, their beliefs, and their pre-existing assumptions. So to the best of your ability, it's important to understand where that audience is coming from and what their goals are in communing, communicating with you. 
we encounter different audiences with whom we communicate every day. Some of you might teach. Your research programs probably include collaborators. Others of you might see patients. You're already communicating regularly about science with all of these audiences, even if you don't think about the process as critically as we're gonna do today. So whether you're doing it deliberately or not, you're probably already used to thinking about the needs of different groups with whom you communicate. We're all in danger of succumbing to what's called the curse of knowledge, our inherent assumption that others have the background to understand what we're trying to say. Because our backgrounds, especially when we've been in a, in a particular field for many years, are second nature. And we don't usually think about them. So that's something in particular that we as scientists need to be aware of. And to compound that, one of my goals today is to provide you with some tips for speaking with reporters, which in practice is often a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. It's you and a reporter, either on the phone or by Zoom or someday in the future sitting in a studio. But ultimately, those reporters are gonna take what they learn from you and from others to convey a complete story to the public. So your responsibility as a scientific source is on two levels. You're communicating directly with the reporter, but also indirectly with the, with the public. So it's important to think about those two audiences. First, the reporter you're speaking with. Do they have a science background in your field, for example? That might be something you'd wanna know. And second, but no less important, the audience for whom they're preparing a story. So to suss some of that out, you can actually ask a reporter how much their readership or their viewership or listenership um, understands. The readership of the Topeka Capital Journal is going to be different than the readership of Scientific American. And that's gonna be different from the readership of the new section of nature. We'll talk later about the unique goals and needs of specific types of reporters. But one simple question you could consider in the context of a reporter's audience, which is also one of your audiences, is what grade level does that reporter aim for their story? It can vary by publication, but a good rule of thumb to keep in mind is that many newspapers aim for an eighth grade reading level in their stories. And what does eighth grade readability look like? Here's a sample from an eighth grade textbook introducing the periodic table. So I'll give you a moment to take a look at that. This is how many reporters are writing, whether it's in print or as copy for radio or TV. So this means that if you explain your work or a current event or whatever else you happen to be talking about at a level that's significantly different than this, that reporter simply may not be able to use what you say in their story. By all means, don't try to make yourself seem smart by speaking over reporter's head. That's one of the best ways to be unhelpful to a reporter and never get another call again. So instead, I want you to think about ways that you can bring the reporter and by extension, their audience along with you. How you can lay a foundation as you start an interview to make sure that you and the reporter are starting with the same general understanding of the topic at hand. Part of this means making sure you're using language that everyone can understand. And that's what we're gonna to get to next. But just to address a couple of common concerns that we often hear from scientists, people worry about dumbing it down. Um, science is full of detail, it's full of nuance, and it can feel like you need to share every single detail to convey the truest picture. But thinking about it from a reporter's perspective, if they get lost in that detail, if they can't understand what the nuance is, they can't get to the point of what it is you're trying to convey. So ask yourself how much precision is actually necessary to understand the principle or the concept you're trying to get across. If you look back at this eighth grade text, this eighth grade reading sample, there's a lot of nuance missing here, but it doesn't actually leave the reader with an inaccurate understanding of reality. It's just not a detailed one. So speaking simply and clearly is not, not only okay in these contexts, but it's preferable. You're gonna do well if you can help the reporter make the under information crystal clear to their audience. You can work together with them to serve that ultimate goal. So let's talk about language and specifically about jargon. 
You saw in our definition of communication a little while ago, the idea of a shared language. One of the habits we have to combat to ensure that we're using a shared language with reporters and by extension with the public is to avoid jargon. And you'll often hear this admonishment in communication seminars, avoid jargon. I pulled together a few definitions of the word and I, that I found to remind us what this is really talking about. And they, they convey, I think, quite a range of opinions on the concept. If nothing else, you have to give credit where credit is due to the person who decided to use the word circumlocution and the definition of jargon. But I hope you'll notice two things. First, there's a purpose to jargon. But second, it's hard for people who don't share that purpose to understand. So let's dig into this a little. There are several types of jargon, and I'm gonna talk about a few of the most common ones here. There's discipline-specific jargon, and these are specialty terminology that are used within a specific group, profession, or industry. These are words like idiopathic, or phylogenetic, or interstellar medium. They're characteristic of a specific discipline. There's also process jargon, um, words like statistically significant or hypothesis that describe specific parts of the scientific process or the way that science is done. These are often um, have, again, specific meanings to scientists, but aren't really um, conveying uh, much detail to somebody who's not familiar with it. Acronyms, um, these are abbreviations that lots of us don't even think about anymore. For those of you who might work uh, with federal agencies, uh, perhaps you get funding from the NIH or CDC or FDA. These are all commonly used acronyms um, that have a specific meaning. And if you're not in that domain, you won't understand what it necessarily means. Acronyms also have the property that they can have more than one meaning. AMA, for example, can mean against medical advice, or it can mean the American Medical Association. If you don't understand the context, you might miss what point is trying to be made. Another example is HR. HR can mean heart rate. It could mean hazard ratio. It could mean human resources, probably a lot of other things too. There's also hidden meanings in jargon, terms that have um, one meaning to the general public and a completely different meaning to scientists. Something like basic research or normal. Um, to a mathematician, normal means something very different than it means to other people. Positive feedback is another example. If you were to ask a second grade teacher about giving positive feedback to her students, um, that would mean something generally positive. If you were asked to ask a climate change expert about positive feedback, she would say, that's actually a negative thing. Positive feedback means things are getting worse. So um, those hidden meanings are often some of the hardest to identify. A paper last year in the Journal of Language and Social Psychology showed that even when you define jargon, its presence alone is enough to impact people's ability to understand scientific information you're trying to convey. In fact, the study showed that people exposed to jargon when reading about subjects like self-driving cars or surgical robots later said that they were less interested in science than others who had read about the very same topics but without the use of specialized terms. So we aim to avoid it altogether. Remember that we use jargon because it's often a shorthand and it's easier since you and your peers share a common understanding of these words Getting rid of jargon often makes things longer. Um, and in the context of making your point as clear as possible to a reporter, that's actually okay. You don't need to think about a one for one word substitution when you're thinking about how to say things without jargon. Phrases are okay to think about as well. Sometimes a phrase is the jargon itself and sometimes you wanna replace one word with several. The goal really is to convey the meaning in clear and understandable language. So here's a simple example. There are probably a couple of words in this sentence that one could consider jargon. But the one that I focused on is exposed. Here's an alternative way to say the same thing that avoids using a word that non-scientists might not understand. So we've gone from people that are exposed to secondhand smoke 
to people can be harmed by breathing secondhand smoke in public, place, public places. So let's look at something a little bit more complicated. This is the abstract of a paper from Science Magazine. Um, I'm gonna give you all a moment to read it, or at least try. Probably a lot of us can sort of muddle our way through it. Even if we don't have a background in virology, we have a general sense of what it's talking about, though we may miss a lot of the nuance and the details. But a lot of us are scientists. We're used to writing like this, and even then we still don't get it all. That's because of the jargon. The scientific jargon really does serve an important purpose in allowing experts within a specific domain to communicate with accuracy and efficiency. But imagine if you're a journalist who, until February, had never covered science or health topics. For you, this abstract is a lot harder. So at Sightline, we took a pen to this and tried to identify everything we thought might be considered jargon. Here's what we found. There's not a lot left that isn't jargon. The one caveat I want to acknowledge here is that I know a journal article abstract is meant for your scientific peers. I'm not expecting you to never use any jargon in your scientific writing. That's not the point here. But if a reporter were to want to write about this, this abstract, it's worth thinking about, or about this paper, pardon me, it's worth thinking about how you might write a lay language summary of it for them. How you might make it simpler and clearer for the needs of the reporter. And that might mean taking a look at all of these terms that are jargon and figuring out simpler ways to say the same thing. So I encourage you to take a look at examples like this in your own field, whether they're your own research papers or just some of the recent literature you've read and take a stab at identifying the jargon that's being used and then literally rewrite it in a way that a non-science audience could understand. It's a really useful exercise to do for yourself. Finally, I want to share with you a fun online tool that demonstrates just how many uncommon words we use every day. Some of you may have run in to the online comic XKCD. There was once a comic that described quite well the Saturn V rocket and all of its elements using only the 1,000 most common words in the English language. 1,000 is rightly referred to as 1,000 in this context because 1,000 thousand is not a common word. And the Saturn V itself is called the Upgoer V. Based on this, there's now a web-based text editor that challenges people to explain any complicated topic using only the 1,000 most common English words. There are a lot of words not on the list that we as scientists might want to use. Things like science, or teach, or information. So the limited words available make this task actually really hard. I've run our paragraph, this science abstract, through the text editor, and here's what it picked up. Shown in red are all of the non-permitted words. And permitted means one of the 1,000 most common words. As before, we're not left with much. So describing your research under those conditions of using only the 1,000 most common words requires some creativity and some thinking about how you would view the world if you were not a scientist. I'm not advocating that you run everything you plan to say through this text editor, but it's worth thinking on occasion um, about this as an entertaining and enlightening tool to think about word choice. If you were to write a lay language abstract of one of your recent papers, you might check it here and see how lay it really is. If your university press office were to distribute a press release about a recent discovery of yours, how might it fare here? So we've talked a little bit about language, um, and now I want to turn to talk about the reporters themselves um, and some of their needs and goals and similarities they share with scientists. But first, let me pause to see if there are um, any questions before we shift topics. Again, if you have a question, you can pop that in the Q&A box. All right. Well, not seeing any, I'm going to power through. And uh, if you can come up with anything, please feel free to drop it in there. 
Moving on to talk about reporters, there's several different types of media outlets and the individual needs of a reporter can vary by that type of outlet. National publications like the New York Times, NPR, or cable outlets like Fox News have a very broad audience and a broad scope. They're often more well-funded than local news, which we'll talk about in a moment, and they're more likely to have a science reporter or a science section than the local news is. Because their audience is national, these outlets often report generalizable knowledge, not something specific to a particular location or group of people, but something that is of interest and applicable to a very broad national audience. In contrast, local news focuses on local issues and applications. This is the news you can use type of news. Some of these local outlets have been um, among the hardest hit uh, by funding cuts over the last decade. Some local news, especially newspapers, um, have closed altogether. And when science, health, or environment reporting does happen at these outlets, it may not be handled by a, report, a science reporter per se. Instead, general assignment reporters, those who cover basically anything that's handed to them, often are tasked with these assignments because the specialty reporters the ones with the particular topical expertise in the environment or health or science are simply no longer there. And these general assignment reporters may be excellent reporters in their own right, outstanding journalists, but they don't necessarily bring any scientific background to their reporting. So the sources they talk to are particularly important for providing the context and the information that a reporter needs. And that's where you come in. Also for local newspapers, radio and television, reporters often prefer local sources. So they're gonna to go to their local universities, local research institutions to see who they can find to comment um, on issues that are happening within their own community. And finally, there are specialty outlets. These are publications that focus on a particular topic like climate or energy or health. And I've highlighted some of the science specific ones here like STAT or popular science. Um, things like Nat Geo. The audience for these publications is typically narrower and it often has a higher, they often have a higher level of understanding of the topic than the general public necessarily does. Um, the publication might allow more technical content than a local newspaper would as well. So the specific needs of a journalist will depend on the type of outlet that they are reporting for, but it also depends on their platform. The most common interview with a reporter that you might do is for a story in print. And when I say print, that could be for a newspaper or it could be for a purely digital outlet, something that exists only online. This isn't a hard and fast rule, um, but print interviews are often the longest interviews that you'll do. There's just a lot more flexibility in, in how long a reporter can spend with you and what they can use from that interview. Um, they can take what you say um, and isolate short phrases, sometimes even single words for a quote. So they have a lot more flexibility, meaning you also have a lot more flexibility in what you say and how you say it. They're able to use those short phrases or words in a quote um, and put more contextual language around it in that paragraph to explain, even if what you literally said to the reporter didn't quite provide the context that they needed. Your ums and your uhs are probably not gonna make the final cut in print. But one thing that can be lost is tone. Sarcasm doesn't translate well in print and it can actually be easily misconstrued. So be careful about using sarcasm or other uh, deeply toned um, statements when you're talking with a print reporter. On the radio or even in podcasts more often lately, the situation is a little different. Radio interviews can be live or they can be taped. Taped and taped interviews can be edited as well, but they don't have to be. Sometimes they're taped and then just played as is as well. This means that your ums and your uhs actually will be heard. Your verbal tics, if you start every sentence with so um, every sentence that the audience hears is going to start with so um. It also requires you to have self-contained thoughts for your quotes. 
You can't refer back to something you said five minutes ago on the radio because that part of your interview might not have actually made it into the story. So you can't really refer back and you need to use quotable sentences um, and chunks of text more frequently. On the radio, tone does come across as well as level of enthusiasm. If you sound like you're bored or uncertain in describing your own research, that will be noticeable. And at least when radio is live, much like live TV, there are no do-overs. If it's a taped interview, you can certainly ask to start an answer over again if you really need to. But remember that the reporter is under no obligation to ignore that first take. They're likely gonna be looking for the best clip that they can integrate in their, into their story. So they're not looking for a way to make you look bad. But in particular, if you change your answer entirely, um, then they're gonna have two different answers from you and they get to choose which one they move ahead with if they choose to use it. Finally, there's television. Like radio, complete sentences and thoughts matter. So does enthusiasm. And this time it's not just your voice, but your body language too. While experts used to get to appear in studio or have reporters come to their office or their lab to collect video, a lot of interviews these days are taking place by Zoom and Skype. So the good news is that you guys are probably about as used to that as the rest of us are. But the same general principles hold via Zoom as, as they would in a studio. Make sure you're in a comfortable position that you can maintain for the length of your interview. Sitting perched on the edge of a chair isn't great for 30 minutes. Um, you're going you're gonna to get uncomfortable eventually. Make sure you're well lit and make sure that you're centered in the frame. Also, make sure that there's enough space below you in the frame for the station to put a chyron with your name and affiliation on it without that chyron coming all the way up to your chin. A producer will ideally help you with those details, but it's always good to have a sense of, of those needs when you're choosing where to sit, where to be for that interview. And finally, keep fidgeting to a minimum. Lots of us has physical versions of a verbal tick. I know I talk with my hands, as you've probably noticed. Other people might bounce their leg or wring their hands. So start to be aware of those habits and how they may come across on camera. One of the more important ground rules to understand is the concept of on the record. Put simply, this typically means that a reporter can quote anything you say in the course of your conversation and attribute it to you by name. And the thing that you need to know is that the time to have a conversation with a reporter about whether and how they can attribute what you say to you by name is before the interview takes place. You don't wanna do that in the middle of the interview and, and after the interview is, is too late. Attribution is an agreement between you and the reporter. And if they don't agree to it ahead of time, they don't have to abide by it. So you can't get to the end of your interview or even the end of a story in the middle of it and say, oh, that's all off the record, right? Because unless a reporter is feeling particularly generous, that ship has already sailed. What you said was on the record because that's what you guys agreed to ahead of time. It's not a great idea in general to go on and off the record throughout an interview, even if you get consent from the reporter each time. It just becomes confusing for you both in real time to remember, I said this on the record, but I said that off the record. So while there are always exceptions to this and to every rule, my general advice is that if there's something you're not comfortable talking about on the record, just don't talk about it at all with the reporter. This might come up in the context of, for example, sharing a personal anecdote about you or your research team, collaborator, a competitor, or even discussing early results of your research before it's published. It's best to stay away entirely from the topics that you wouldn't feel comfortable seeing in print attached to your name. By default, reporters will generally consider every interview on the record unless you've explicitly agreed to a different arrangement. Some reporters will even consider any conversation, whether in front of a camera or at a cocktail party to be on the record. So just be aware of your surroundings and what you say in the presence of reporters. On um, background can also have a variety of meanings, but it often refers to information that can be used and quoted, but not attributed to you. 
different reporters do have different understandings of that different um, sort of rules that they adhere to. So again, it's really important to have a conversation with a reporter ahead of time so that you both agree to the same terms. I talked about different types of media outlets and platforms, um, but just to give you a glimpse of the ecosystem of journalism in general, here's some data about how the landscape has changed in recent years. In the decade from 2008 to 2018, nearly 30,000 jobs were lost in newsrooms, a decrease of about 25% um, in journal of, of practicing journalists in newsrooms. If we were to look at just what happened to newspapers in that time, it's even more severe, with newspaper staff decreasing by nearly 50% over that time. Partly that's due to decreased revenue as circulation has dropped. In terms of where people get their news, it turns out that most adults in the US still prefer to watch their news. And that's mostly on TV, not online, which is surprising to me. The second surprising thing is that it's not actually just old people. It's true across a range of demographics that people prefer to watch, not read their news. Now it's true that a larger percentage of younger people are watching their news online, but they are still watching local TV. So if you're thinking about how to reach people and how to share your science, it's not only the big national outlets with high profile names that people in your community are paying attention to. Their local outlets, especially local TV, are important trusted providers of news. At the same time, these local newspaper, radio and TV stations are far less likely to have reporters that specifically cover science, environment or health news. A lot of those layoffs I mentioned at the top impacted those reporters in particular. That means that when science is covered, as I said before, the reporters doing that work may be excellent journalists, but are unlikely to have the deep background in science or the broad network of community experts they can turn to for context. And this is where your expertise can be incredibly valuable. I've walked through a lot of details about how different reporters can be, um, how different the reporters can be across different outlets and different platforms. But at a high level, journalists and scientists actually have a lot in common. Both professions are filled with people who are genuinely curious. They hold themselves to high standards of accuracy. Nobody wants to get anything wrong, either um, in print in, in a newspaper or in a journal article. All of their work is subject to rigorous review. Things don't get published without multiple rounds of eyes. And both have an interest in being the first to publish, right? Nobody wants to get scooped, whether it's a news story or your research. But that doesn't mean that there's 100% overlap in your goals. And some of those differences are things that you should keep in mind as you prepare and you practice. Journalists are often looking for something colorful or personal that they can include in their stories. But scientists can be hesitant to share personal anecdotes or experiences. We're trained to aim to be objective and to not necessarily have our personal opinions or feelings impact what we do. But those feelings, those experiences, those anecdotes are often what reporters are looking for. Journalists also aim to get a source to let their guard down and be more unscripted. One of the things I'm gonna tell you later on is that we always recommend for people to go into an interview with three points you wanna make. Journalists wanna hear those three points, sure, but they also wanna hear something that you weren't necessarily planning to say. They'll actively try to put you at ease and make you feel like you're talking to a friend, but don't forget that you're on the record. If you choose to discuss something you hadn't planned for, make sure it's because you decide to do it not because you found yourself rambling a bit and stumbled into doing it. The next one is about the difference between simplicity and completeness. And we talked about that a little earlier. That balance between accuracy and simplicity that you, is something you'll need to think about a lot. How incomplete and straightforward can you be without actually being inaccurate? Because you never wanna give an inaccurate picture, but maybe all of the context and detail isn't necessary to convey the information that you wanna convey. And finally, journalists are looking for everyday applications of science. You might be doing bench, bench research on cancer cells, but they'll wanna know if you're gonna have a cancer, a cure for cancer next year, or is it gonna be another 10 years? 
They want to know when that's going to be something that's going to impact people's everyday lives. And scientists, we always hesitate to speculate. We emphasize the limitations of our work because we don't want to overstep. We don't want to get out there too far beyond what the evidence tells us. So there's a little bit of a, a push and pull on that point as well. I don't tell you these things in any way to scare you away, but rather to encourage you to be deliberate in how you prepare and how you respond during an interview. Finally, I wanna talk a little bit about what science stories actually make it into the news. Because we know that not every new piece of science actually makes the paper. Journalists report on what's newsworthy, and that depends on the audience. Local and national outlets may cover the same piece of research, but in very different ways. One may tie it to local scientists or organizations or to local events, whereas a national outlet may highlight its broad applicability across many regions. And a specialty outlet might even cover discoveries or research techniques that are of interest to a science savvy audience, but not to the general public. So let's look at some characteristics of newsworthy stories. One example might be a science angle on a local issue. So for example, say um, you're living in a community where there's a, a chemical manufacturing plant um, that has a, an accident, there's an explosion. The local issue is that explosion. What happened? Why did it happen? Who is to blame? But the science component of that story might address how that explosion could affect air quality as a result and how that change in air quality might affect the um, health of local citizens. You could also think about an interesting paper or result, especially something that's unexpected. So for example, maybe a, a species long thought extinct is discovered on a remote island. That particular species may not be um, what one would consider quote unquote important um, or even necessarily cute because everybody loves something cute. Um, but the finding itself is unexpected and objectively exciting to learn about. So that's something that might get covered in the news. You can also think about a growing um, or long-term trend. So say for example, um, the, the example we came up with here was growing evidence suggests that uh, jolts to the head can lead to brain disease. A single study suggesting this finding is probably not gonna make the news. But when many studies from different research groups and with um, different uh, methods start to create a reliable foundation of evidence, that becomes something that reporters pay attention to. Um, sorry, okay. Can also, you can also think about a unique individual, a laboratory or technique. So say, for example, scientists are simulating black holes in their lab. Black holes don't have a lot of practical applications to everyday life, but they are mysterious and they are novel. And so this is an unusual experiment that would necessarily capture people's interest. So this might be something that would be covered um, by a reporter. They're also often looking for concrete impacts of science on people's lives. So a new diagnostic test that could catch breast cancer early, this could directly save people's lives. Um, and maybe the knowledge uh, that people need, this may be knowledge that people need in order to make better decisions about their health. So reporters are gonna be very interested in that. There may be scientific research that isn't um, in, you know, um, normal times particularly newsworthy, but because of a particularly timely event or, or, or current events, um, it becomes newsworthy. So this, this idea that this um, example that we made up um, says that perhaps kids who learn remotely with parental support show increasing language skills. I don't actually know if that's true. Like I said, we, we made some of these up. Um, this might be particularly newsworthy because so many children are stuck at home due to COVID. So it's particularly timely because of what's going on in the world. It doesn't mean it wasn't important research a year ago. It just wasn't timely. And it's that timely aspect that makes it newsworthy. Finally, your personal perspective or opinion um, is also something that's newsworthy. So for example, a local climate scientist weighs in on state legislative actions. As an expert, your opinion on topics within your area of expertise carries weight, especially with the local news. And sometimes even with 
not within your area of expertise, as you may have noticed, um, opinions by, by noted experts carry weight. So that's something that, that a reporter is going to follow up on. Uh, but just because something is important science doesn't necessarily make it newsworthy. So here are a few examples of things that are actually more often than not, not newsworthy and probably not going to make a reporter's radar. Despite how it sounds, the word worthy in the, in the term newsworthy um, doesn't have any judgment on the value of the science. It's just about whether it's going to make the morning paper. There's a quote from a book by a journalist and professor, Sharon Friedman, and it says, editors and reporters tend to value stories that contain drama, human interest, relevance, or applications to the reader criteria that don't always map easily onto scientific importance. So you can see that there's a bit of a, a dichotomy there. So things like incremental discoveries and confirmation of previous results, while these are important elements of the practice of science, they're not particularly newsworthy. Outcomes that are vague, being able to say something might happen at some point in the future, also are probably not gonna be covered. And finally, if you can't succinctly explain why the public should care about a result, a reporter probably isn't going to care about it either. I can particularly relate to that one. My background is in astronomy. And aside from the occasional cool factor, it's sometimes hard to explain how astronomical discoveries will impact someone's everyday life. I want to talk a little bit now um, about how journalists find sources, because we've talked about what they need, what they're looking for, what they think is newsworthy, but how do they actually find someone to talk to? We actually have worked with um, hundreds, if not thousands, of scientists, of reporters over the last three years um, at Sciline. And we've had the opportunity to hear from them about how they find sources. Um, so some of these results come from that feedback and some of these results come from um, the fact that some of my colleagues at Sciline were former reporters. So we've collected all of that information here. A lot of these ways won't really surprise you. First, reporters will just search. They'll use Google or Bing, whatever is at hand, and they'll do a web search. They'll also look at specific organizations, such as their local university um, or a research organization, a government agency, um, to find out who the available experts are there. Sometimes they'll look at primary literature, and this happens most often with specialty reporters, not necessarily um, with local reporters. But they'll look at PubMed, they'll look at Google Scholar and ResearchGate and other sources that aggregate the scientific literature, not only for um, sort of resources and, and papers related to the topic they're covering, but to see who those authors are. They might ask for help, for example, from public information officers or media relations experts at a specific institution. These people can be intermediaries and connect reporters to the experts at their institution. And finally, reporters look at who is being quoted elsewhere, at who's speaking out elsewhere in the news. And that also includes on social media. More and more, I've seen reporters using tweets in their news stories or even asking on Twitter for help in finding a source who can talk about something specific. So if you want to be engaging with reporters, and this is where they're looking for sources, there's some easy things that you can do to make it easy to find you. One obvious step is to have a professional website, not necessarily a professionally designed website, although that's always nice if you don't have to do it yourself, um, but one that highlights your professional work. On that website, you should provide descriptions of you know, your academic background, your current projects you're working on, your research experience in general. And for those of you that already have a website, all of that stuff is probably there. But I bet if you took a close look at it, you'll notice that it's really focused on providing information that's relevant to collaborators, potential students, and research colleagues. And that's not a bad thing and is definitely a very important audience your website should focus on but it won't necessarily meet the needs of reporters. They may not necessarily get from those descriptions the information that they're looking for to decide if you're the right source for them to reach out to. One of the things you could do is add a list of keywords that describe your research in non-jargon terms. 
If the reporter is looking for specific expertise in their words, you want to make clear that you have that expertise in the same words. You could even choose to include a list of topics you would feel comfortable talking about in the news. And this might be broader than your specific area of research expertise. Lots of us have a very narrow focus in, in our research domain, and we have to. We're very narrow and deep. But the things that you could talk about in the news might be broader than that. You do have a breadth of knowledge um, that other people, people non-scientists don't. If you've been quoted in the news media, provide brief descriptions and links to those in interviews on a section of your website. I also suggest separating media clips that are about your work from the articles in which you're actually quoted. Sometimes a reporter wants to see the kinds of things that you've said in an interview to see if you are a good fit for what they need. So those are two slightly different um, sets of, of media interviews you could, or, or media clips that you could include. And if you've done radio or TV interviews, you should list those too. It's okay if you haven't, lots of people haven't. Those are much rarer. Um, but maybe you've given a public lecture of which there's a recording or a department seminar or a presentation at a conference. Any clips that convey your communication skills on video can be very useful for a reporter to watch. And for video and audio especially, um, it's useful to include the date the event was recorded. It's really helpful context to know if that was recorded last month or 10 years ago. Finally, there are a few other ways to be noticed. You could choose to write op-eds. These can appear in your local paper or other widely read publications, um, depending on, on who your audience is. Op-eds written for a non-science audience might be a dem better demonstration to a reporter of your communication skills than ones that are written specifically for the scientific community. So for example, those that appear in scientific journals. But there are a lot of reasons to think about writing an op-ed, so don't base it solely on what you think a reporter wants to see. If it's relevant, that be, again might be something, um, if the op-ed that you've written is relevant, that might be something you want to feature on your website as well. You can also get involved in social media. I'm not going to talk about this in this talk other than to point out that reporters do use social media. Um, and you could start following some reporters whose work you like to get a sense of how they engage on the platform. Are they having conversations with the public and with sources? Are they asking for people to volunteer to be sources for specific um, articles they're working on? There are also expert lists that you can sign up for, sometimes through your scientific or professional society or through other, other organizations that maintain lists of, of experts who are willing to talk to the media such as 500 women scientists. You can also contact reporters directly. And I don't necessarily mean to pitch a story about your work, although there are ways that you can do that. Um, we're not gonna talk about that, that here though. But reporters, like everyone, appreciate hearing when their audience likes their work. If you come across a particularly well done article that's related to your area of expertise, it is perfectly okay to reach out and let the reporter know that you think they did a good job. And you can also offer to serve as a source for them if they can plan to continue covering that topic. You can also get in touch with your university public relations office, such as the folks sponsoring this event, um, to let them know that you're interested in speaking with reporters so that when journalists come to them looking for sources, you're on their radar. And finally, you can sign up with Sideline, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, one caveat to remember, if a reporter reaches out to you to ask for an interview, a quick response, even if it's to say, no, I can't do it this time, is really valuable. You'll be remembered as somebody who's responsive, even if you couldn't do that interview, and they'd be more inclined to come back to you again. Reporters work on incredibly short time scales sometimes, hours, sometimes days if they're lucky. And so they are used to not hearing back from a lot of the sources they reach out to. So if you're one of the ones who says, yes, I can, I can talk to you, let's, let's chat in an hour, or no, I've got class all day, I can't do this one, but please contact me again, they're gonna remember the people who got back to them. We've covered a lot of ground from talking about different types of media outlets and reporters to thinking about your dual audiences, reporters and the public, um, as well as the language you choose to use. And all of that information and advice boils down to this, that it's really important to prepare. 
Preparation in, includes, but isn't limited to, thinking about the messages you want to convey in an interview, practicing what you want to say and how you want to say it, and soliciting feedback when possible from colleagues, peers, and friends. In the same way that you prepared for the first few presentations that you gave early in your career or the first few classes that you ever taught, preparing for interviews is going to take some time at the beginning, but I promise it will get easier. And in the spirit of that preparation, one thing to keep in mind is that if a reporter calls you, or as is often the case these days, emails you, you don't actually have to speak with them on the spot. You're unlikely to have the opportunity to put it off for days, but it's perfectly reasonable to say, you know, now isn't a good time for me, and I'd like to take a few minutes to gather my thoughts. Can I get back to you in half an hour? And unless they're truly, literally about to go to print, the answer is likely to be yes. So here are some other questions you should ask of a reporter before you agree to an interview. Ask who the reporter is and how you can reach them. Because again, you don't have to do the interview at that very moment. Ask what outlet is it for? We talked about different types of media outlets and platforms, and you may want to tweak your messages or your preparation to fit that specific outlet. You should also ask about the reporter's timeline. Those of you who have done interviews before know that, that journalist timelines can be short, so it's helpful to know what kind of flexibility that they have. You should also ask what the story is about. Why are they reaching out to you? What specific expertise or insight are they looking for? Which gives you an opportunity to think about, do you have that expertise and insight? Or are you better off suggesting that they talk to somebody else that you can recommend? Some reporters won't share questions ahead of time, but some will. So it's worth asking, even if they say no. And ask about the format of the interview. Can you send responses by email? Some reporters like that. Do you need to be on camera? Is it live or is it recorded? And you should always actually expect to be recorded, even if it's a print interview. Uh, reporters will usually record the audio. These days when, when folks are on Zoom, sometimes they'll record audio and video. It's a safety net for you both. The reporter can play it back to ensure that they get the quotes right, and they don't have to take detailed notes in real time, so they can stay more engaged in the conversation, knowing that they have captured a recording of what you said. So use the answers to these questions to help you decide whether the interview would be a good fit for you, and if so, to prepare to have a su successful conversation. So before we dive into talking a little bit about Sideline, I wanted to pause again for questions. I've seen a couple of them come in. Um, let's see. Early on, um, there was a question about the text editor um, that I showed early on when talking about jargon, whether it comes in more languages. Um, I don't think the text editor comes in other languages. Um, another question says, how can you answer questions that aren't as simple as yes or no? For example, clinical results that are statistically relevant but need more research to be done to confirm them. Is there a way to answer without disappointing my audience? So I think the way to answer that is to be honest, that there isn't a simple yes or no. Um, reporters want something simple and short, and I think you can say, um, you know, you're not disappointing them by saying there isn't a yes or no. You can say, this is what we understand now. This is what the evidence tells us now. And these are the unanswered questions that still need to be answered before I can give you a definitive yes or no. Um, so I think that's one way, one way you can handle it. I wouldn't worry too much about, quote unquote, disappointing your audience. They may have an expectation. But what you're there to do, as, particularly as a scientific expert, is to provide the evidence. Um, and, and I think that you can clearly um, explain what the evidence says and, and what it doesn't say. So that's how I would, would handle that. Let's see. Um, I see. I see one more coming in. Let me, let me pause for a moment. Well, that's coming in. I'm going to move on to talking about Sideline next. 
Ah, here's the here's the ex the last question that came in. Uh, too often, experts claim to not have the right expertise. How can I, as a journalist, get them to explain it? I think, um, gosh, that's an interesting question from the journalist perspective. Um, I think what I often say to scientists when I'm trying to remind them of their breadth of knowledge is that lots of us have taught 101, topic 101, physics 101, bio 101, chemistry 101, whatever it happens to be. Um, you don't need to have the same depth of knowledge that you have in your research domain across every possible topic. Because um, often, you know, what journalists are looking for, if they if they've reached out to you, is sometimes that breadth, um, sometimes being able to fit a particular topic in a broader context, and that's what having that breadth of knowledge um, enables you to do. So I think that's how I typically um, talk with scientists about about this topic. But I I completely um, understand and have heard your point that scientists are reticent to to talk outside of their specific domain sometimes. And we tend to underestimate for ourselves tr our true breadth of understanding of a particular topic, especially in comparison to folks who are not scientists and may have, have very little exposure to that topic about which we know so much. So thanks for that question. I wanna spend uh, a my last few minutes talking specifically about Sciline, about my organization, to tell you a little bit about what we do and how. Silent's whole mission is to connect reporters who are working on stories about science or stories that have a science element to them with the scientific experts and information that they need to get that story right. Silent is a program that's based at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is uh, one of the largest scientific member organizations in the world. Um, we've been around for about three years now. Um, three years actually next week, now that I think about it. Um, and we've grown from a team of three to a team of 11. We are staffed with uh, scientific experts. I have a team of four um, scientists who I work with uh, that, that liaise with the scientific community. And then we have also a bunch of former reporters, uh, public affairs experts and speech writers who work on our journalism side of the house. Um, and they do a lot of the liaising with the, with the journalistic community. So together, we all uh, work at that intersection of science and journalism. I'm not gonna talk in depth about all of our services, um, but these are two that I, I wanted to mention before focusing on um, a couple of the others. Our fact sheets are tight, deeply researched and vetted summaries of newsworthy science topics around which there's often misinformation or misunderstanding. We research and write these internally, and then we turn to scientific experts around the country and ask them to essentially peer review them for us. Uh, we ask for your, your feedback, your criticisms, what did we miss? Um, what is, is not a balanced um, presentation of the facts? So that by the time we, we take all of that input from scientists um, and make the edits and publish that fact sheet, it is, it is a product that journalists can rely on and simply drop facts from that fact sheet into their stories if needed. These include topics like lead in US drinking water or vector-borne disease. We have a new series that we call, or newish series that we call Quick Facts that cover a lot of climate change and extreme weather related issues. We also do media briefings. Um, similar to our fact sheets, we focus on science topics that may be particularly complex or misunderstood and that reporters cover nationwide. These media briefings bring together typically three experts from around the country who give short five minute presentations on uh, one aspect of a, of a topic. And then we leave the rest of an hour for Q&A with reporters who are listening on the, on the line. So very much like this, uh, this presentation right here, but with much shorter presentations. Um, in recent months, many of our media briefings have focused, as you might guess, on COVID um, and more recently on voting in the upcoming election. So we cover a really wide range of issues. Our expert matching service is sort of the bread and butter of what we do each day. And it's the very first thing that Sideline debuted when we started. Here's how it works. Reporters who are working on a specific story and need an expert will reach out to us via our website they tell us a little bit about the story they're working on, the outlet they're writing for, and what kind of expertise they think they need. 
We take that information and turn to a database that we have built uh, that is populated with scientists from around the country across all domains of science. And we try to find a handful of people that we think are uh, the right fit for that reporter's needs. Um, I and, and my team, we reach out to those scientists individually and say, we have this interview opportunity. Here's what the reporter's looking for. Here's the outlet. And most importantly, their deadline is today at five. And for the experts that get back to us and say, yeah, I'd be a good fit for this and I can fit this interview into my schedule. We share that information, your contact information with the reporter so they can follow up with you directly. Experts can always tell us no for any number of reasons. I'm too busy, I don't want to, uh, this is outside my area of expertise. Uh, but all of that comes back to us at Sciline. it's not you talking directly to the reporter. So you've got a little bit of a buffer there. We've had lots of inquiries over the three years from uh, reporters across all different um, types of media, uh, local outlets, national outlets, and everything in between. Lots of inquiries about, um, pardon me, lots of inquiries about environmental issues, for example, ranging from lead and radiation discovered in neighborhood soils and the health issues those may cause to drinking water contamination in their communities, um, such as with PFAS, the per and polyfluoral fluoroalkyl substances, um, the chemicals that have recently been discovered nationwide and waste from industrial sites and runoff from fire suppression chemicals. So lots of environmental type stories. And of course, we're working on COVID inquiries a lot lately. We connect reporters every single day to experts who can talk about vaccine development, contact tracing, local and state level data about the spread of the disease, safety of different activities such as attending school or sporting events or family and friend gatherings. So we're doing this every single day, reaching out to experts to help reporters get the information that they need. And really everything in between those two examples from environment to COVID and everything else that you can think of. Finally, before COVID, we actually led multi-day intensive trainings for reporters to help them get up to speed on specific topics. We collaborated with the University of Illinois, for example, on genomics for journalists last spring, covering the basics of genomics as well as applications to health, agriculture, criminal justice, and other domains. Um, as you can see from this tweet from one of the reporters who attended, we got them all into lab coats, uh, pipettes in their hands, and had them do a little uh, uh, crispering. So uh, in a, the course of a couple days, these reporters got a, a crash course in what they needed to know to be able to better cover genomics in their communities. We took a slightly different tactic later in the summer and assembled about 30 political reporters in Iowa as the 2020 presidential primary season was getting underway in order to talk about science issues that might be relevant to the campaign. We talked about climate, energy, water resources and agriculture, because of course we were in Iowa after all. We talked about trade and about immigration. This was all pre-COVID, so COVID was not on the, on the menu at the time. Um, but once again, we had a couple of days with all of these reporters. We took them out to see a, an active uh, cattle and corn farm. Um, and it really gave them an opportunity again to dig into some of those science issues and better understand them so they could take that information back to their reporting. And we honed in on some specific geographic regions last fall with our boot camp on the community impacts of oil and gas development. We talked about environmental health and social impacts that oil and gas extraction has on local communities. Now, all of these trainings have, have changed with COVID, but we're still exploring ways to continue offering training in a virtual setting. All of these services that Sciline provides wouldn't be possible without the help and the expertise of scientists like you. You are the people we turn to when a reporter comes to us for help for a story. You're the ones we turn to um, to fact check our, our uh, fact sheets. And, and you're the folks who actually um, we recruit to teach our boot camps as well. So we couldn't do what we do without experts such as you who are willing to talk with reporters or support their reporting in other ways. And if you're interested in getting involved, I'll have the URL of our website on my final slide for you. I wanted to close by offering you a few tips that we share with all of the experts we refer to reporters. We haven't had the time to talk about each element of this during the presentation, but I thought I would still go over it with, each, with you. So first, 
and I alluded to this a little bit, you should go into an interview with two to three messages that you wanna make sure a reporter hears from you. One of the unique attributes that you bring to the table is the ability to back up those messages with evidence and with data. So make sure you think about including that in your messaging. A reporter often has a specific set of questions that they're trying to get answered, but you can always take a moment at the, at the beginning to talk about the context before diving in the details. Remember that we said early on to make sure that everyone is starting from the same place. This is a really valuable way of ensuring that you're being understood and that you and the reporter are on the same page before you start in to get into the nitty gritty details. So even if the first couple questions that are, are posed to you by the reporter start to dive deep, it's totally okay to take a step back and say, let me just, let me just set the stage for a moment before we get into that and give a little bit of a big picture view. It's also okay to disagree with the premise of a question. You don't have to answer a, a poorly or misframed question just because the reporter asks, asks it. It is absolutely okay to say, you know, I don't think your premise is correct. What I see is this other thing, or that may be one factor, but the bigger issue is this other topic. And take that opportunity to explain why you think the situation is different than what the reporter has posed. If you don't know the answer, you can say that. But by all means, don't ever make anything up. It's also helpful if you feel comfortable to make a recommendation of a colleague who might be better positioned to address a topic that, that you just don't know the answer to. That would be really helpful for the reporter. And finally, at the end of the interview, ask the reporter to summarize what their takeaways are from the interview. If the reporter misunderstood something, this is your easiest opportunity to clear that up. And if the reporter caught two of the three messages you wanted to convey, you have the perfect opening to say, one other element that you shouldn't overlook is, and then clearly state your remaining take home point that you had already prepared ahead of time. One thing that's not on this list, but that I've been reminded of recently, is always have an answer in your back pocket to the question, what have I not asked you about that you think I should know? or lots of different variations on that question. You can answer this a lot of ways. You could highlight an exciting new research development that you know is coming. Um, you could even reiterate some or all of your key messages. But this question is a gift. Don't let the opportunity go by by saying, you know, there's nothing left for us to talk about. This is your door to say whatever you think the reporter should know. Um, so don't, don't miss that chance. And with that, um, I think I'm going to close and have time for a few questions. Um, you can see here uh, the URL to um, sign up for Sylines list of Sylines database of experts and also my email address um, in case you'd like to reach out. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I know we have a few more questions. Where does Sylines funding come from? Excellent question. We are fully funded by philanthropies, some philanthropies that are focused on uh, supporting journalism, some that have more of a science bent, um, but they're entirely uh, uh, supporting Cyline um, and its mission to be able to provide all of these services completely for free, both for journalists and for the scientists that we work with. So there's never a charge for anything that we do, including for our boot camps. We fully pay for um, reporters to come to our boot camps um, we reporters don't have to pay for any of the media briefings or expert matching service, none of that. Any other questions? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can at least see some of you again. Um, here's a good one. Uh, what if I, as a scientist, have a story idea? What should I do? Uh, that is a very handy question, uh, particularly for us at Sciline. One of the things that we recently debuted um, was a scientist tip line. Uh, this is an opportunity via our website for scientists who have a story idea to share that with us. 
um, we can help you develop that idea. Um, we can help you develop that idea and then and then we can pitch that idea to reporters who are in our network. Um, so that's one way you can you can um, share that that idea. You can also think about interacting with reporters on social media. Um, as I said before, lots of reporters are on Twitter. They're looking for sources. Um, and you can also talk about story ideas there. Any other questions? Here's one. Do you focus on building relationships with major media outlets or also with more local and community-based news outlets? That is an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, because our primary focus really is to be able to work with local reporters, local television, local newspapers, um, and local radio. Because we know that that is an important source of information for members of the community. That's where most of them get their news. And those are also the newsrooms that have been most challenged over the last decade in terms of loss of funding, um, layoffs of reporters, and the ones typically most lacking um, in scientific expertise among their pool of reporters. So that is our primary focus. We, we do work with, with reporters from national outlets as well as from specialty outlets like um, Popular Science and Scientific American and Nat Geo. We work with freelance reporters as well. Um, but our primary area of focus is local reporters. Thanks for bringing that up. Here's one more. Uh, what if there is a factual error in a story in which I'm quoted? What should I do? Another great question. Uh, you can reach out to a reporter and let them know. No reporter actually wants to have a factual error in their story that is as by no means a goal and it's actually um, much like a factual error in a journal article you might publish it's something about which they really don't want to um, have out there in the world they don't want to be perpetuating misinformation so if you are quoted in a story or even if you were interviewed for a story and you see that's that there's a factual error it is perfectly okay to reach out to the reporter um, and let them know that you think that there is a factual error um, providing any evidence or information that would, would demonstrate uh, what, what the correction is or could be, I think would be helpful to share. Um, what's sometimes less helpful is to get in touch with a reporter and say, well, why didn't you quote me on this? Or, um, you know, I, I didn't like how you made me look here. Th those aren't the types, uh, types of corrections that are gonna be necessarily productive, but certainly the factual errors are something that reporters want will want to um, correct right away. I think we are, are nearing the end of our um, hour and 15 minutes. So if folks have any additional questions, feel free to drop them in the chat um, in the next minute or so. Um, and otherwise, please feel free to reach out to me directly or to check us out at uh, Sciline.org. You can also find us on social media at Real Sciline. Um, so I encourage you to contact us and sign up for the database if you're interested in being a part. Okay. I think I don't see any more questions coming in. So with that, I think we will conclude for the day. Thank you all so much for your attention and for joining us.